Hello, I'm Jim Paxson. Welcome to Arizona Wildlife Views. Today, we're on the Colorado River fly fishing at Lee's Ferry. For that and a whole lot more, stay tuned. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. This is Lee's Ferry. It's a blue ribbon trout fishery on the mighty Colorado River. It starts at Glen Canyon Dam and continues for about 16 miles through Marble Canyon all the way to the upper reaches of Grand Canyon. Some people tell me we have pretty good scenery. I've traveled around and fished lots of places and I have never seen a place with this type of backdrop that has great rainbow trout fishing. Seven wonders of the world, only one has trout fishing. Terry Gunn owns the Lee's Ferry Anglers Guide Service. You know, one of the neat things about Lee's Ferry that a lot of people don't realize, this is all wild rainbow trout fishery. I mean, there is no stocking that goes on here. There hasn't been any stocking here for, for 20 years, virtually. And uh, these are all wild rainbow trout. You don't find that many places. Well, the first question I normally ask everybody, but since you're with Game and Fish, I don't have to worry about if you've got a license. I have a license, yes. <laughs> with a trout stick. <laughs> a guided fishing trip at Lee's Ferry should be on everybody's bucket list. And on this breezy morning in early May, Jim Paxson gets to scratch it off of his. I've got to jump out here. He's going fishing with Tyson Warren, who's been a guide for Lee's Ferry Anglers since 2001. Park the boat on the beach here. Keep the boat safe. Now it's been years since Jim touched a fly rod, and he's never fished anything like Lee's Ferry. And here we are, it's a tough work day on the river. <laughs> you know, I was in Colorado for 12 years, and, uh, and I did some fly fishing in beaver ponds. Fly fishing was pretty good but I was not by any means expert. That's okay because right. Tyson is an expert and today he's showing Jim how to fish the Colorado River. Here we fish mainly underwater. Uh, we use uh, the food source up here uh, basically consists of midges which are little gnats and they're waterborne. Uh, we have uh, San Juan worms that's a waterborne earthworm and we have a thing uh, with a scientific name of gamorous but it's we call it a scud and we'll be using all three of those today. Water here is about 46 to 48 degrees year round. So this is our fishing area here. If it was a little warmer, a little less breezy, you'd see a whole bunch of little guys jumping on the inside here. And it's shallower, and these fish like to sit right on this seam here. So that's what we're gonna try to take advantage of today. We're gonna work on getting the line out, doing this, without disturbing the indicator. We're gonna try to get that indicator to go down the water without moving all over the place, because if it's moving all over the place, the flies underneath are moving all over the place, and the fish know that that's not real, mm -hmm. that it's not a natural state, and they'll ignore it. The goal is a natural drift, making that artificial fly look like real floating food instead of something tied to a line. line One way is to this. keep the tip of the rod low not when shaking the line end. out. That way the current can grab hold of the line and do some of the work for you. All right, we're gonna throw it out again. Gonna put a little bit of a mend in there. The other technique is something Tyson calls a mend. Mending the line is a little maneuver that's coming up right after this cast. Here it is, a flip of the wrist that so keeps the line, the line floating behind, behind the, the indicator. It just ups your chances of, of getting right. that. Yeah, you're not, you're not moving the indicator in here. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's not moving across the current. It's going with the current naturally in the fish like that. Yeah. So let's do a couple more of these before we load it up with some flies. Okay. okay, there you go. 
Jim spends a few minutes working on the techniques Tyson showed him. Do, yeah, perfect. Throw a little mend in there upriver. There you go, beautiful. More line out, more line, there you go. Pretty, that's a nice drift. Then it's time to catch some fish. This is a midge in its larva stage. So we're just gonna go with one fly on there for now. Okay. That's what it looks like. This That's is a in huge the, hook, isn't uh, it? in the fly fishing roll. This is a size 18. 18. In some places that you will use about a fly about half that size. These are called thingamabobbers. <laughs> Seriously, that's that's the brand name of it. Okay, whenever you're ready to cast. Okay. Okay, way high over your head and let it roll. Just Go ahead and out. uh huh. Set, fish on, buddy. Set. Oh, oh. Set, 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 set. Okay. <laughs> I, I missed it. <laughs> yeah. And I was way, way discombobulated too. <laughs> yeah, we were just about a minute too late on that one. Yeah, a minute. That's that's all. <laughs> Other than that, it was okay. Yeah, there he is, right there. Set. That's a fish. Your batting average right now, you're over two. <laughs> The nice thing is you're doing this drift really good. It takes a lot, some people, it takes them hours to learn this. It's not about catching, it's about fishing it. There he is, Jim, set it. So when you set? Yeah. Okay. Gotta bring it up and keep it up, huh? Yeah, do a yeah. Statue of Liberty thing. Yeah. You can really get, really get your hand up. Set, set. Woo, oh my. It came out of the water. That was a nice fish, fish too, wasn't it? That's that a big boy there. It. Yeah. Tyson kept telling me yeah. that I had to be quicker and set the hook harder because there's so much line in the water. You know, it's a learning experience and and uh, just having him in an affirming kind of coaching way uh, develop my skills was, was really impressive. Time to move to a new spot. Okay. Well, hey man, you got hit a lot in there. Yeah, that was fun. Have a lot of line here. That water's really moving. We're seeing fish of all sizes. We're seeing fish from, you know, six inches long up and up to about, uh, you know, a two-foot fish is a real big fish for us. But everything in between, which is really indicative of a healthy river. Right now, the fish population is as good as we've seen in many years. Fishing's been really good here. Like, oh, get him, Jim. Oh, good eye, man. We almost had him. As a blue ribbon fishery, we have to use barbless uh, hooks, and we're using such small flies. It's really easy for the fish to spit there these. Set. So good. what we mainly try to really emphasize is just getting the technique down. But the goal here is, because of our catch and release uh, uh, practices, is not to touch every fish or to see every fish. It's just to have a good time, and if you're if you're, every time Jim makes a cast, he thinks he's gonna get hit. Uh, see, that's how good the fishery is. A guy that fishes every day like me, I, I will hold on to more fish than Jim does, but that's just because I have more experience. But the fishery's so good here that, that even someone that comes out on their first day, even if you don't touch a whole lot of fish, you're still gonna have a great time because you're always gonna get hit. I got a fish. There you, yes, you do. Now take your time with him. Keep the rod tip up like that. There you go. Very nice. I can't tell. Oh yeah, you still got him, but boy, you sure got a lot of moss on there. You're about out of line, so now you just got to start lifting your rod and bring that guy up here. But that's a nice little female. You can tell a female because once they get into the 12, 13 inch size, their mouth is still nice and proportioned, and a male will start getting the hook jaw. Hook jaw, yeah. Start looking like a salmonoid. All right, well, we're going to release this. Oh, don't have to release much. He's gone. Yes. We're not skunked. Right on, good for you, Bubba. <laughs> that was a good catch. There are fish in here. Yes, there are lots of fish in here. Love it. It was a gorgeous day, blue sky, a few clouds, and catching a fish. I mean, it was just, it was a kind of a once in a lifetime deal. Pretty hard to see. If you didn't know they were there, you wouldn't, probably wouldn't see them. That far, I'm gonna probably head on over that direction real quick. 
see anything over there. Conducting surveillance. Get a GPS, general GPS location on them. And gathering intel. This work has an air of espionage. 582, 508, you trying to get a hold of me? But it's an overt operation, a mission to find precious fawns in a herd of pronghorn that's on the verge of disappearing. It had reached a low of somewhere between 16 and 20 animals. Game and Fish Wildlife Manager Brad Folk is talking about the Sonoida Elgin pronghorn herd that lives in the grasslands of southeastern Arizona, not far from Sierra Vista. Hopefully we'll start picking some critters up. It's about, what, 5.30ish? In the early 2000s, oh, wow. the herd averaged about 80 animals. By 2011, as few as 16 remained. Well, I think historically pronghorn populations in Arizona have, have cycled through ups and downs. We've done several releases, supplemental releases in these southeastern Arizona population. Drought's a huge component. There's no single reason for the decline, but loss of habitat is definitely a factor. Human development has carved up the countryside with fences and roads that impede the movement of pronghorn. Yucca and mesquite are choking out their grasslands, and nearly two decades of drought has limited the availability and nutritional value of vegetation that pronghorn eat. That affects the health and birth weight of fawns and diminishes their ability to survive. The population stress is here. We have drought, of course. Uh, but more importantly, these pronghorn have gotten to such a low threshold that the loss of even one fawn is absolutely critical and unacceptable. So that's why we would like to get up to 100 animals and then they can sustain natural mortality. We modified three miles of fence along this boundary. And this is Glenn boundary. Dickens is with the Arizona Antelope Foundation. His group has been working with Game and Fish to improve habitat by building water holes, modifying fences, and using prescribed fire to open up grasslands and stimulate the growth of new vegetation. They burn 320 acres, and uh, just here in the last uh, month, there have been two does and two fawns observed dead center in the burn, which you'd expect. See anything over there? Despite all of that work, the Sonoida Elgin herd remains a population in peril. For three straight years, 2009 to 2011, zero fawns were added to the aging herd and its numbers plummeted. I mean, drops of 50% two years back to back. So we went from 60 some animals down to, 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 a, to a high of what we could best estimate is like 16 to 20 animals. Folk says a healthy herd should average 40 fawns for every 100 does. You know, the past 10 years, our fawn to doe ratio has been roughly averaged about six. That's not near enough to support a population. That's why we saw that steady decline. So Folk and the Antelope Foundation went to the Arizona Habitat Partnership Committee with a project proposal designed to grow this population of pronghorn. Funding was granted and the three-year project started in 2012. It includes a plan to supplement the Sonoida Elgin herd with 70 to 80 pronghorn from New Mexico and Chino Valley in Arizona, and to improve fawn survival by removing coyotes that prey on young pronghorn. We're just trying to buy them some time while they're in that stage of development that they're just basically helpless. The translocation hasn't happened yet, but a contract hunter has been hired to remove coyotes during an eight-week window when fawns are most vulnerable. It's specifically targeted to fawning areas. We have fawn drop here May 10th. Give or take 10 days, 80% of the fawns will drop during that period. So those, that coyote removal is very strategic. It only occurs in April and May when the fawns are being dropped. The project calls for three straight years of predator control. And as far as numbers of coyotes taken in here, you know, it's surprisingly high. The first year we, we just hunted the population by, by hunting methods. And, you know, in this area, there was only like 12 coyotes removed by, by the hunter. This year there was 26 removed. In addition, about 90 coyotes have been trapped on private land during their regular trapping season. And, and that is nothing but a positive for, for pronghorn antelope. I think we got about 10 people out right now doing a saturation ground survey. Trying to Folk and his team are out here today to find out if that and, work uh, paid off. We're mainly just focusing right now on what, what kind of fawn crop we got hitting the ground because uh, within the last month, month and a half, we've had some fawns born and 
From uh, early glimpses, uh, it looks like it's going to be a pretty good fawn crop again this year. Last year we had 20 fawns born, which was uh, unprecedented numbers. Uh, after our first year of predator control, we were really happy, and we're, if we can get that again this year, we're going to be we're going to be off to a good start for a three-year project. There we go. There's a doe. Let's hope she's got a companion with her. I got a single doe. All I can see is one right now. I'm hoping there's a fawn around her. Just have to watch her for a while. She's just standing still. Yep, there's a fawn with her. Two of them. She's got twins. That's awesome. That is awesome right there. There's nothing like seeing the doe with a fawn, and there's nothing like seeing the doe with two fawns. <laughs> 2013 was another good year. The survey team discovered 17 fawns, bringing the total to 37 in the first two years of the project. That's really the goal behind this is sustaining a native population of pronghorn here in the grassland habitat. It's about keeping antelope in a landscape where they were native to. The intensive predator control project is giving this herd a chance to grow. The translocation of 70 to 80 additional pronghorns scheduled for January of 2014 will make the herd even stronger. Our goal is to have over, you know, 125 or plus animals here after our three-year project. You know, give them a good shot in the arm and, and see if the population can go ahead and grow on its own from there. It's no sure thing. The real test will come when the predator control ends and coyotes are back in business. But Falk is optimistic. Everything's looking pretty solid right now. With a little bit of help from Mother Nature in the form of drought relief, he believes the long-term success of the Sonoida Elgin pronghorn will prove to be a mission accomplished and not a mission impossible. That is awesome right there. The Kaibab Plateau in northern Arizona can be treacherous, rugged, and remote. Still, early visionaries realized that this special place was worth protecting. 13 years before the Grand Canyon received national park status, President Theodore Roosevelt created the Grand Canyon Game Preserve to conserve the unique flora and fauna that live on the plateau, especially the mule deer herd. Over 100 years later, the wildlife in this area is still being protected, now by the Arizona Game and Fish Department and the wildlife manager assigned to the region. In 1992, when I found out I was coming to the Kaibab, I had been awarded this district, a friend of mine that had went through the academy with me told me I was going to the jewel of Arizona. And, and every time I go to work, I think about that statement that he made and just how accurate it was. I think the Kaibab's an incredibly special place. Uh, as a result, I've been here since I started, uh, over 19 years now, uh, with no plans to leave or go anywhere else. Game management in Arizona is a big job. And the men and women who take on that responsibility cover a lot of big territory within management units all across the state. The Kaibab Plateau is in Unit 12A and covers over 1,200 square miles north of the Grand Canyon with elevations ranging from 5,000 to 9,200 feet. It has very few facilities and the closest town is in southern Utah. But being assigned here does have its perks. Yeah, I get to go to lunch on the edge of the Grand Canyon uh, when I feel like it. Uh, the neat part is I typically have it all to myself. I'll drive out to one of those points and, and have lunch for a half hour, 45 minutes, and, and just soak in the splendor of, of, of northern Arizona. And, and it's really hard to beat. While this area is beautiful, it is also home to some of the largest mule deer in the country. And hunters who are lucky enough to draw a tag for this unit usually don't go home disappointed. The job of managing this huge tract of land with its wide variety of species and habitat can be a challenge. Well, the Kaibab's an interesting district for a wildlife manager in that uh, it has a lot of notoriety associated with its deer herd. 
and as a result, uh, a lot of the things that I do, other wildlife managers in the state don't do. Uh, we do a lot of habitat work up here for the deer herd. Uh, we're doing uh, constant studies, uh, research branch of the Arizona Game and Fish Department's up here looking at habitat quality and forage availability. Uh, we're catching deer every spring and looking at their health coming out of the winter. Uh, we've got the check station uh, where every deer hunter on the Kaibab has to check out when they harvest a deer. And so there's a lot of things going on in the Kaibab that don't happen in the rest of the state. Well, well, the deer capture presents a pretty neat opportunity for somebody that's interested in wildlife and wildlife work and that, that it's hands-on work. You're actually handling the animals, uh, which, which really is a rare thing uh, in this day and age. I think people often assume we're we're hands-on with the critters in the hills all the time, but we're really not. Uh, we observe them constantly, uh, but, but actually hands-on work where we're handling the animals and taking measurements and things of that nature are really re relatively rare occurrence. Okay, back teeth are all white right now. Okay. Wildlife managers are considered the face of Arizona Game and Fish because they interact with the public more than most employees have the opportunity to. On this day, Todd is patrolling during a Miriam's turkey hunt where he gets to know the hunters in the field, something he obviously enjoys. One of the interesting things in Arizona is that most of the hunting public and most of the public in general that we contact are really happy to see us. Uh, I think a lot of states, game wardens, aren't really looked upon as favorably as they are in the state of Arizona. And, and I think so, that has something to do with the fact that our people have some life experience, they've gone to college, um, as a result they're a little bit older, and, and they interact with people a little bit better. But it's, it's, it's really heartwarming to see people smile when you pull up their camp and invite you into camp. Uh, I regularly get offered cups of coffee, I regularly get offered meals. People want to spend time with us. And I think that's because we know a little bit about wildlife and wildlife habitat and we can talk to them and help them uh, do what they're doing. And, and as a result, the, the, the support by the Arizona public for us in the field is, is really, I think, probably unparalleled in North America. While wildlife managers in Arizona are commissioned law enforcement officers, they're also required to hold a college degree in a wildlife science or closely related field. This allows them to not only enforce the law and assist the public, but to develop and create habitat improvement programs specific to their management areas. Well, in 1996, we had a, an incredibly large fire on the west side of the plateau in the Mule Deer Winter Range. It burned up about 56,000 acres. And the year following that, it occurred to me that it might be an important thing to start uh, looking at efforts to rehabilitate some of that burned range and try to get uh, some forage species back on the ground, food for deer, uh, and, and try to restore some of the wildlife habitat that had been lost in that fire. And of course, Mother Nature will do that on her own, um, but, but we as humans are a little more impatient and we'd like things to happen a little faster. And so in, in 97, I sat down and I mapped out about 25,000 acres of, of various habitat treatments. Um, things like seeding in places that had burned pretty severely, uh, I also looked at some areas where things hadn't burned, where we had really thick stands of uh, pinyon juniper trees that were kind of choking out the, the vegetation that underneath them and going in and removing some of that overstory to release those plants and give them a chance to thrive. Uh, and also looked at uh, some of the old habitat treatments that had been done historically, primarily for cows, um, but had turned into really, really good winter mule deer range and we went back into several of those and restored them to the condition they were in in the 50s. Uh, as part of that plan, we also built, uh, we've built so far eight new waters and we have five more new ones to put in. And so we're looking at 13 new water sources on the west side of the Kaibab for wildlife. Uh, really good water distribution, almost ideal. And so I think uh, some of the things that we've accomplished in the last decade have really, really been productive. Maintaining those water sites is also part of Todd's job but it's just one of a hundred things he does each year to make sure the wildlife in the Kaibab will be here for a long time to come. And I take personal pride in the fact that uh, some of the things that, that we're accomplishing on the Kaibab are, are gonna be left. Uh, it, it may sound corny, but I think of them as a sort of legacy, something that 50 years from now, my grandkids could come back and say, you know, my granddad, he, he did that. And, and it's here for us now. And I think that is, is something that, that not many people get to accomplish in their careers in America anymore. And I think having that legacy is an incredibly important thing to me. The job of a wildlife manager in Arizona is a unique one 
and not for everybody. But after 20 years in the field, it is still the perfect job for Todd. Well, I think the wildlife manager job in the state of Arizona is probably the best job in the world. It's an incredibly diverse job. Uh, many people aren't aware that, that a large portion of our job is not law enforcement. Most people Im immediately assume that uh, what we do is primarily law enforcement. And really that only constitutes about half of our duties. Uh, we, we get to survey wildlife populations. We develop uh, hunt recommendations that result in the permit levels uh, for hunt tags that people apply for. Uh, one day you may be sitting in the office working on paperwork and the very next day you're in a helicopter flying over the Grand Canyon looking at desert bighorn sheep. It's really, really a dream job. Uh, I, I regularly tell people that no hick kid from northern Michigan should have ever expected to get to do this for a living. And, and I believe that. Well, that's our show for today. Hope you enjoyed it. For more information on anything you've seen, check out our website. For all the good folks at Arizona Game and Fish, I'm Jim Paxson. We'll see you next week.